Hello everyone, welcome to ECMATH. Today we're going to talk about secant and cosecant graphs. We're going to first build the two parent functions. Um, we're going to go over that pretty quick and then we are going to go just straight into examples today. So today mostly is a day of working on example problems. So the first graph we're going to graph is y equals secant of x. Uh, actually, that's a lie. We're going to graph cosecant of x first. And the reason we're going to graph that is it's because it's the reciprocal of sine of x. And we're probably most familiar with the graph of sine of x. So because this is a reciprocal function, uh, a number of things are going to happen. When sine x is going to be 0, cosecant x is going to be undefined. Um, it's going to have a vertical asymptote. And when sine x equals 1, well, cosecant of x is going to be 1 over 1, which will just also be 1. So that's going to be a shared value in between. And that's also true with positive and negative 1, positive and negative 1, positive and negative 1. So those kind of establishing uh, the asymptotes and the 1 values are probably the most important part of the graph of cosecant. So what does the graph of cosecant x look like? Well, let's scale out our axis first. We'll put pi here. And then what I'm going to do is go ahead and graph really sketchily uh, sine x. That's not what sine x looks like. It looks like this. You can choose any scale you're comfortable with for that graph of sine. And now I'm going to work off my observation. So I notice that when sine of x is 0, so that happens at pi. It happens at 2 pi. It happens at 0. And it happens at negative pi. Cosecant, the reciprocal of sine, should be undefined. It should have a vertical asymptote there. So I'll go ahead and plot those as vertical asymptotes for cosecant. Then uh, I also observe that when sine of x is 1, cosecant should also be 1. So that happens at the pi over 2, the 3 pi over 2. At 3 pi over 2, sine x is negative 1. And it happens at uh, negative pi over 2 as well. Then I want to think about what's going to happen with this graph. Um, starting from 1, I'll just pick this value right here and work out. As I approach this vertical asymptote, the graph of cosecant is going to shoot upwards. Why is that true? Well, because right here, sine x is approaching 0. So 1 over sine x is going to kind of approach 1 over 0, which approaches positive infinity. So that's why this goes up to positive infinity. Now when you actually reach zero, it's undefined. There's no value there. Um, so think about the sine graph getting smaller, which means it's reciprocal it has to get larger. Now if we travel backwards, it seems true that the same thing will happen. Down on the other side, we're going to have the same thing happen. But because we have a negative one, we're approaching negative one over zero, which is going to approach negative infinity. That is my cat you can hear in the background. She's upset that she's not allowed in the bedroom right now. Too bad. What I've just drawn here is one full period of the graph of cosecant. If you choose to continue, so notice here what I'm noticing is that one period is actually two branches of the graph, is two pieces. Um, you have to have a full cycle to create a period of the graph. Period means one full cycle. And so a full cycle of the cosecant and secant graphs is going to be one curve opening up and another curve opening down. And that together makes a full cycle. So if, you're, if your book is telling you or your teacher is telling you to graph one full period, you need to graph this. If they're telling you to graph two full periods, then you need to graph four things. You would need to graph something like this. And this is not quite two full periods. I could either continue off 
this way. I'm out of space over there, so I'm going to choose to continue off this way. Once you sort of establish the pattern, you don't have to draw that inside function anymore. You can just mirror the pattern that you've established. So now I have two full periods of the cosecant graph. Let's go ahead and move to the graph of secant, which is going to look almost exactly the same, except it's the reciprocal of cosine. So just like before, I'm going to graph a cosine graph very nicely in green right here. I'm going to be smarter about leaving space for my graph. One full period of cosine goes uh, from 0 to 2 pi and the same thing backwards. Now I'm going to do the same thing, which is put vertical asymptotes wherever cosine of 0, cosine of x is 0, because every vertical asymptote means that secant of x is 1 over 0, which is undefined. That's why it makes a vertical asymptote. We'll do that as a dotted line. There's another zero here. There's another zero here. There's a final zero right here. Notice that there's not a vertical asymptote at the actual number zero. Uh, where are those asymptotes at? So that would be at half pi, three halves pi, negative half pi, and negative three halves pi. It's going to pay off later on when you do transformations to know exactly where those asymptotes are for the parent function you're looking at, because uh, just like with tangent, being able to identify the asymptotes is really the, the most important part of creating the graph. So knowing where kind of the two most important asymptotes are, I think these two are the most important ones, that can help you create the graph. So now I've got my inside cosine function. I've got my asymptotes from where the cosine is zero. Wherever the cosine is one or negative one, I know that uh, secant of x will also equal 1 or negative 1, respectively. And then as you, starting at any of those 1 values, as you approach an asymptote, you uh, are dividing by a number that's smaller and smaller, so the secant x is going to grow larger and larger, or uh, in the negative direction, it's going to grow smaller and smaller. Now, I'm going to do something a little strange here, because this is how you see it presented in your book, and I don't like it but I'm going to show it to you because it does confuse people. Um, what your book does is draws a nice square viewing window right around 0, 0 when they're establishing the secant graph. And they say, aha, well, this is not one full period because I need the, uh, the U-shape down. So they'll draw one half of a downward U-shape over here, and then they'll draw the other half of the downward U-shape over here and say, aha, guys, this is now two, uh, one full period of cosecant because we have one complete U-shape up here. And then we have like two halves of a U-shape that are not really connected over there. Technically, they're right that this is counts as one full period of the cosecant graph, but it's silly. Uh, I don't think it really captures the shape. It's sort of like if you were to draw a graph of tangent and you were to draw it like this, and you were to say that my graph of tangent looks like that. That's silly. We know what the graph of tangent looks like, and it really should be drawn like this. They're just choosing to kind of clip their graph in a weird way, and I think they're doing the same thing here. They're choosing to clip their graph in a weird way. I guess defensively if they're trying to sort of circle around zero, but I think it's better just as a matter of practice to draw two full periods of this graph so you don't get clipped off in any kind of weird ways. Just draw periods of this graph until you run out of paper. And there you'll have your cosy, your uh, sorry, secant graph. And uh, it really, if we look at both of these, they look a lot alike. They look really, really similar. The main difference, in fact, the only difference is the inside function is shifted over uh, left and right by a factor of pi over two. So these are phase shifts of each other. And what that means is that the two functions have different asymptotes secant of x, the one we were just looking at, 
has asymptotes on the pi over 2 values. Why? Because that's where cosine of x is equal to 0 on the pi over 2 values. On the other hand, cosecant of x, the reciprocal of sine, has asymptotes, oh, not there, has asymptotes on the pi values and 0. Why? Because those are the values where sine x equals 0. And so if you're ever stuck remembering where the asymptotes are, just remember which function is the reciprocal and work from there to understand where the zeros are. Wherever the zeros of the reciprocal are, that's where your zeros, the asymptotes, will be. I'm going to try to keep these videos to about 10 minutes. So since that was just the two parent functions, we are going to stop it here. Please check out the next video where we will graph four different examples of transformations of secant and cosecant graphs.